All right, well, I'm going to admit that uh, today's lesson was kind of prompted by a Facebook post. Um, not entirely. It was already in my sort of thoughts of stuff to do coming up, but I was prompted on Monday by a Facebook post. And I was like, okay, well, this seems like a good week. It's prompting me to do this. So I decided to cover it. I also covered it with the men a few weeks back when we started Common Man, Uncommon Life, a Tuesday night Bible study that we're doing. So if you're in that men's study, I'm sorry, it's, <laughs> there's going to be some overlap on that. But. And it's kind of in two parts. I put this together and I sort of thought, I'm just going to do the first bit, which would be an introduction. And, uh, but then I started doing more and more about that. And so it ended up a little bit kind of two parts. But they are connected, I promise you, in some way. So um, anyway, so bear with me on that. So when we think of DNA, we think about the building blocks of life. The, the way that we're put together so that we can serve effectively in the kingdom of God. And the DNA of any animal is so unique that if there's slight differences, it can create some dramatic differences in some cases between different animals, different people. We look differently, we act differently, we have different personalities, that type of stuff. And that's all the differences in the DNA recipe that we have. If you're identical twins, well, you might be excluded from that statement. But anyway, this is the DNA of us. It's a breakdown of who we are. But there's more to it than that. If we look at the science and what is determined to be kind of the four elements that help life to survive or thrive in any way, then there are four main ones. And this is kind of the DNA of life. In its very basic form, and I apologize if you're a science teacher in here, I'm probably not being very accurate with this, but I'm trying. The four elements basically that we need, the DNA of life, are food, light, water, and air. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going to do the first part. <laughs> so keep that sort of in the back of your mind, and we'll get back to it later. But what I want to do now is get to a story in the Old Testament. Last week, we kind of looked at Jonah, and we thought, well, this is one of those stories that when you're in Sunday school, it's great. And then when you come out of Sunday school, you don't really hear about it very often. Well, we're going to cover another one a little bit like that. And this is in the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus, chapter 3. And we start at the beginning of the chapter. And it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. And Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses replied, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. And now, we're going to skip to verse 9, where it says, And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. This is God speaking still. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people of the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you, have said to the, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So here we see Moses in God's presence. An amazing sight. A bush that was on fire but was not burning. Last week we talked about the powerful images of God. Stuff that God does that is so obviously God, it can't be anything else. This is no exception. It might have been on a slightly smaller scale. But it's an amazing picture of power that God paints for people around him. So this is on a little bit of a less scale. But Moses certainly took notice of this. It got Moses' attention. There was a bush on fire, but it did not appear to be burning. So he knows he's in the presence of God. What else could it be? Plus, God tells him. He says, you're on holy ground. Take off your shoes. So he knows he's in the presence of God. And then God tells him that he needs to go back to Egypt. He needs to go free the Israelites from slavery, from the Egyptians. And the first thing Moses says is, nope, I think you got the wrong guy. Sound familiar? Jonah. I'm like, no, but he didn't run. He just said, he was going to use words. No, I think you got the wrong guy on this one. 
Why? Because he was wanted back in Egypt. He had to escape from Egypt. He had killed one of the Egyptian soldiers. So now he had to escape from Egypt. And it had been quite some time. was not about to go back into that. So Moses took this a step further with God and said, okay, let's just suppose that I do go. If I go back to Egypt, what do I say when people ask me who sent me? And we read, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the Lord of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what do I tell them? And this is where God tells him, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. So let's look at this statement, I am. God calls himself, I am. What does this mean? It just sounds like, potentially, that somebody mistranslated this. Or that it's not very good English. I am, I am. I mean, it doesn't sound like something that just rolls off the tongue. But now this name was very important. Naming back then was very important. People just didn't make up names and think, that sounds good, kind of like we do now. You think, what can I name my children? It's like, well, my last name is this, so we'll go from there. And what sounds good with that? And then we throw in a middle name that seems to fit. We don't really take much care about what names mean. But when God named people, it really had meanings behind it. If we look at examples in the Old Testament, Adam named his wife Eve because she is the mother of all living in Genesis 3. God changes Abram's name to Abraham to show that he had made him the father of many nations in Genesis 17. God changed Sarai's name to Sarah in Genesis 17. He changed Jacob's name to Israel in Genesis 32. And then in the New Testament, God, when the Son of God was coming along, he wasn't going to take any chances. He said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins in Matthew 1. So God has the right and he has the power to cause anyone that he names to become what the name implies. The names that he gives are pretty good indicators of the destiny of the people that he names. And when he names himself, we can be sure that he wasn't just randomly choosing names. Sometimes you can choose a name about how it sounds, after an ancestor, or sometimes to avoid embarrassing nicknames. My name is Mark, because my parents did not want it to be shortened. So they picked a short name that couldn't be shortened. <laughs> and then they proceeded to call me Marcus most of my life. So <laughs> they lengthened it, not sure why. But. but he chooses names for the purpose of revealing himself to people so that they can feel closer to him, they can trust him more, and they can strengthen their faith through what he does for them. Now notice in this section of scripture, God gives three answers to the question. We only read two of them, but there are three. So he says, what should I tell them your name is? And in verse 14, God says, I am who I am. And then again in verse 14, he says, I am. And then in 15, he goes on to say, Yahweh, or Lord, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. So it appears that this particular bit of text provides an interpretation of the name Yahweh in a couple of ways. The name Yahweh and the name I am are built out of the same Hebrew word, Hayah. And the other, word, the other point is that Yahweh seems to be used here as fairly interchangeable with I am. I am has sent me to you, verse 14. Yahweh has sent me to you, verse 15. It seems safe to say that Moses' purpose in meeting God at this particular time was not just so that God could tell him to go and free the Israelites from slavery, but also that God could reveal to us his name and the connection with the name Yahweh. Anyway, so what does it mean? I am who I am. What does that mean? Well, there's some implications that we'll go through. First is, it means God exists. And that sounds like an obvious one. But sometimes we need reminding. We forget God exists sometimes. And so, I am is a clear indication God exists. I am. It also means there is no reality outside of God. He is God. Nothing exists outside of God. There's no reality outside of God. He created, but before he created, there was just him. He created everything else. Everything that is under God is reality. Nothing else exists outside of that. It also means that God does not change. Malachi 3.6, God said, I, the Lord, do not change. He does not change. Why? Because if he is the reality, there's nothing outside of him to influence change. We ourselves are our own reality, but we have other stuff around us that causes us to change, that influences us to change course, to change our mind, to change what we're doing. But there's nothing outside of God, so nothing influences him to change. He is the furthest extreme. 
It also means that God is an inexhaustible source of energy. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. So if God is the everlasting and only reality, then he can only be the creator of the heavens and the earth. And if he is the creator of everything, it stands to reason that all energy, whether it's motion, combustion, fusion, or fission, whatever the, for the, the, the source of energy comes from, it has to be from God. And it's not depleted. So the name of God is very definitive. And it perfectly ca- it encapsulates his nature. And the reason I bring up this particular reference is because I'm trying to get to the point of those two words, I am. Because now we're going to switch to the second part, which is in the New Testament. So we're going to go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus uses that expression, I am, seven times in the book of John. So when we say that there's four basic elements that make up the DNA of life, four basic elements of life, we can view these through the words of Jesus. So let's look at these four, starting with food. Food comes from the ground. The ground is dirt when mixed with Water, it makes mud. A mother's worst enemy, a dog's best friend. (laughs) The quick fact about this is that the ground or dirt that we can cultivate food in only covers about 12 million square miles of earth. And you're like, well, 12 million, that's a lot. No, it's less than 5% of the earth's surface. We take it for granted here in the Central Valley because we've got cultivation of, of crops going on all over here. In fact, we can grow anything here with water but we'll we'll get to water later. (laughs) So less than 5%. The rest of it's all covered in water, desert, ice fields, whatever else is covering the earth, but not dirt that we can grow in. So food produced from the earth, we need food in order to survive. We need nutrients in our body for survival. Without food, we're not going to last for very long, so we need to physically feed ourselves. So this brings me to the first reference of John. What does Jesus say in John? Well, John chapter 6, we start in verse 28. It says, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is to believe in the one that he sent. So they asked him, What sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives to this world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. I am the bread of life. Of all the Gospels of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000 is in all of them. John is the only one that takes the time to go a little bit step further the next day when he talks about what happened, what Jesus, Jesus is explaining a little bit more about bread. So he'd fed 5,000 people today, or the day before with, with loaves and fish. So that takes place right after this. And this time Jesus is criticizing him a little bit. Jesus says that they're only coming to be fed again. All the people chased him down. But he said that what they should do is look for the true bread of heaven. But the crowd took Jesus' words literally. They wanted to see as much bread as they could get. He thought they were promising them again that the manna from heaven would come down on a daily basis, provide all the bread they need, make life much more convenient for them. But in reply, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. So it's clear that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He's painting a picture in this case. Because the bread that Jesus offers is eternal life and satisfies spiritual hunger, not physical hunger. And coming to Jesus for this bread is not, going, it's not like going to the bakery or as the Israelites did in the desert, plucking it off the ground. This just involves believing. It just involves coming to Jesus Christ and finding eternal life to find salvation. That's how you get the bread of life. So we might ask ourselves, how did the Jews miss this point? And for us, it's easy. We can look back and say, well, that's the point of that. But how did they miss that? How did they misinterpret what Jesus was saying? Well, the answer is that they were no different than we are. Back then, material rewards of life were much more pressing, much more attractive than spiritual rewards. 
They wanted this non-ending supply of bread that was given to them to make their lives convenient. Everything we are and everything we have is a gift from God, including material blessings. Material things on themselves are not evil. However, Jesus is constantly reminding us that material possessions, money, homes, cars, vacations, etc., they're fine. But the most important thing is to be in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that relationship with Jesus Christ is made present in us every day with the Holy Spirit. And if we want life in all of its fullness, if we want the bread that Jesus alone can give us, only this can sustain us fully in all the things we go through in life and it prepares us for the journey of life. So that's bread. The next thing is light. We need light to survive. Food needs, well, the food that we talked about grows and it needs light in order to grow. And in John chapter 8, Jesus, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he says, and this is verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. For all people, darkness kind of makes them feel uneasy, a little bit fearful. Light, in contrast, is reassuring, and it makes us feel the more positive. The darkness, a lot of people are scared of the darkness. Sometimes at night we get fearful, we start thinking about things, and nothing seems good. Problems seem amplified. Things are much worse when you're in the darkness of night. But when you wake up in the morning, it doesn't seem quite so bad. Darkness has many implications. But a clear example of negativity that's implied by darkness you can find in John chapter 3, where John tells us that Nicodemus, who's a ruler of the Jews, he was very high up in the Jewish culture, he was uh, one of the Jewish um, leaders there, came to Jesus in the night. Why did he come in the night? He didn't want to be found out. He didn't want people to see him coming to Jesus to talk to Jesus. He was a Jewish leader. Jesus was the enemy of the Jewish leaders. So he used the night. So often it's used as a metaphor for secrecy, uncertainty, lostness even, or even evil. Whereas light is used for a metaphor for for hope, for good, for direction, for clarity and certainty. So not surprisingly, when Jesus, the master of communication, uses pictures like this in order to help us to understand his teaching. Twice Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 8 and John 9. In John 8, he uses these words to hostile Jewish leaders. All they want to do is destroy him. He's making them very uncomfortable. He sees their closed minds as a form of darkness. He hears what, how they react strongly to what he has to say. When he says, I am the light of the world, he's also saying that the light is not in the temple anymore. Things, a day is going to come when the temple is not going to be as important. The lights that they put in the temple was not going to be the light that shined. The lights were going to be us. Jesus was going to be in us. The Holy Spirit was going to be in us. That is the new temple, us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. We don't need the temples that the, uh, the Jewish leaders were in charge of. He's also saying the Jewish law will go away. The Pharisees had intricate sets of laws not always just so that people would follow God, but so that they could control the people. He's saying this time is going. So it's no wonder the Jewish leaders were a little angry and hostile. What's most important to them, Jesus is now saying, is going to go away. Darkness can certainly make us uncertain and fearful. To say someone is walking in the dark kind of implies that they've lost their way. To say someone's walking in the light means that they know exactly where they're going. Light and darkness are powerful symbolic ideas and Jesus used them Jesus used them to speak about his own ministry. His ministry was there to scatter away the darkness and to bring light to those that listened to him and those that followed him. So that's light. The third element is water. Water is critical to the survival of life here on earth. And this one is not so much an I am statement. This is more of a Jesus will give us. It will be given to us. He's talking to the woman at the well in chapter 4 in John. Verse 7, it says, When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
but because Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman replied, you have nothing to draw with. The, wa- the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, drank from it himself, and also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Notice that he does not say, I am the living water, but that he would give the living water to her. And when she received it, she would never thirst again. Of course, it doesn't tell us in this passage what the living water is. We have to go over to John 7 for that. And when we get to John 7, he's now, John, Jesus is now surrounded by a throng of people. There's a lot of people around him worshipping, and he suddenly cries out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So that's kind of a repeat. It's flow from within you. By this, he meant the Spirit. So here's where he tells us what it is. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So here Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is the living water. The gift of the Spirit would be something that would live inside the believers, but it had not yet been received. It says here, we see that later on in the book of Acts. So in this case, Jesus is not saying he is the living water, but the living water is the Holy Spirit that will be left in believers. And that's very similar, because the same way we get to air, the final of the four, the living breath, John 20. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you, and the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And this is after the resurrection. Jesus, after the resurrection, comes back to the disciples And it's it's at this point that he does this. He's not physically giving them the Holy Spirit in this case, but it's widely accepted that he was breathing on them in preparation that they would accept the Holy Spirit. And that comes later in Pentecost. So those are the four. Food, light, water, and air. Scientifically, that's what life needs. All supplied by Jesus through his words. But we know Jesus better than this. These are just the basics. Because now we get to the other I am statements in John. John 10, verse 7. Therefore Jesus says again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come out, they will come and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what this passage teaches us more than anything else is that once we become part of the good shepherd's flock, he will protect us. He will feed us. And he'll act as a gate to what's called a sheepfold, which is where they keep the flock of sheep safe, away from wild animals, away from thieves. And we will be in there and he will close the gate. He will stand in the gap between that, us and those that want to destroy us. But it also ties in with another I am of Jesus, same chapter. Only a few verses later, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when the wolf comes, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the, the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. These analogies of farming were used very commonly with Jesus because it helped the people around him to understand exactly what he was talking about. That kind of picture was easy for them to understand. So Jesus also talks about the parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18, the imagery of Jesus as the shepherd and the church as the flock. It's a powerful image and very precise. The fact that in verse 11 he says, the shepherd lays down his life for his sheep reinforces for us that he's foretelling his death for us, the sheep. In John 15, we find Jesus saying, I am the vine, 
You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will not bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's written in the foyer. You can look at it on the way out. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So here he's comparing himself to the vine. I am the vine. So if he's the vine, we are the branches. We're attached to the vine. If we're not attached to the vine, branches on their own cannot produce fruit. They cannot grow. They cannot be fruitful. If we are not attached to Jesus, if we're not connected with him, we will wither. Our faith will wither. We will not produce the fruit that is supposed to come from us as outlined in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Without being in Christ, we cannot produce fruit in our lives and the faith will wither. Then we get to John 11 and 14. In John 11, we look at the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. Jesus was off doing his ministry and the sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick and that he was dying and could he come? Well, Jesus took a few days to get there and the sisters were not very happy about that because Lazarus, in the meantime, had died. So in verse 21, it says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So even though here in this story, Jesus does physically raise Lazarus from the dead back to earth, but Jesus says this to Martha. And those that believe in me will not die. They will no longer exist here. They will not live here, but they will be with me eternally. And Jesus took away the sting of death. For Christians, it's not a bad thing. It no longer has power over those that believe in him, and they will have eternal life. If we move across to chapter 14 in John, Jesus here is providing some answers to his disciples, and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to pre prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, it will come back. I will come back and take you with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here it's not just about where we will go. He tells us where we're going to go. There will be a place prepared for us. God made the world in six days. Jesus has been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. Imagine what kind of place that's going to be. But how do we get there? Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, even though he's just told him where he's going. He says, we don't know the way. How do we get there? Well, now he says, I am the way. So, why am I going through all this? What's the point? God set the scene with Moses. He is the beginning, the end, the same always, the great I am. But Jesus picks up this and with a series of I am statements and other promises, and that meets not just our basic requirements of life, but way beyond that. Our elementary needs are taken care of, but he does so much more for us. And this brings us to one basic but very fundamental truth, that Jesus is sufficient for our every need, not just our basic needs. He provides for us so much more. He will be the lifeblood for us, for everything that we, mean, that we need, no matter what the circumstances in life bring us. He is sufficient for us to handle it through him. He is the bread that we need for sustenance. He is the light we need to see in the darkness in this world. He is the gate that protects us from anyone wanting to destroy us. He is the shepherd that will lay down his life for ours. He is the vine that, f that feeds us the branches feeds us what we need to produce fruit in our lives. He is the resurrection and the life. So that when we believe in who he is, when we die, we will not really die. We will have eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We all want to get to heaven. 
But a lot of people don't know how to get there. What is the way? Well, he is the way. He provides a path for us to follow. But beyond that, Jesus provides for us a couple of other things. The living water, the living breath, the Holy Spirit. So that when he left, when he ascended into heaven, he replaced himself with the Holy Spirit. So that we could all have inside of us the Holy Spirit to guide us through life. It was a gift. So now we get our own I am. I am a child of God. We just sang about it. We just need to find it in ourselves to embrace it. And when we do, we will find the completeness that it provides. We will find that he is more than sufficient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the teachings of John, for the opportunity to realize that Jesus was telling us all along that not only can he meet our basic needs, but he can meet so much more. And that whatever comes along in life, he is sufficient for us to lean on so that we can walk through every scenario with confidence and comforted by you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We just pray that we will embrace the Holy Spirit to use it in our lives to provide not just for us what we need, but also those around us, to be the light to those around us that need it. Lord, help us to understand that there's only one way, one way to the place that you prepared, and that's through you. And this is a message that we must send to everybody that we know, because it would be selfish to keep it to ourselves. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Have a great week.